2015 because in the book I speak on how my life down spiral spiral mm -hmm. uh, my senior year. So uh, it went from 89 to I ran for city council and I was challenged for my seat that I won that I ran and then I had to go through this whole pardon process. So that just changed the whole palette of my taste buds. So that just um, changed the lens on the things that I saw and then I went from a negative hustle into a positive grind. Status Podcast. We appreciate you, man, coming on. You know, we recognize what you're doing in the community. We recognize what you've been doing for a long time. Um, cool Cuts is back in McKeesport. Mm -hmm. Much yes. needed. I, I tell you what, you took it to White Oak. It, it was it was a good thing, but it was different, man. It we was, need, we needed it back <laughs> in the court. It's like something missing. It was, it was rushed. That wasn't of my choice. The yeah. whole building shut down, so we had to, you know. Adapt real quick. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have you at us back in McKeesport, man, for sure. But we appreciate you coming on and talk about your story. It's good to have you, man. Appreciate for having both of you guys. Yeah, no doubt. We got the new book out. Uh, Lessons, Lessons from the, the Chair, baby. Lessons you know, from the sure Chair. Make sure you grab that. Make sure you grab it. It's a great read, man, about life stories. Someone who, you know, born and raised in McKeesport, you know, coming up and going through some adversity, changing his life. And now he's got everything that you're looking at here. Um, blessings. Ble it's a, that's all you can say. It's a blessing, man. It's a blessing. So, first of all, what inspired you through a pandemic to sit down and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to write a book? Uh, well, the, the, the pandemic helped push it because I had a lot of time on my hands. You know, as like most people, we were doing, I was doing a lot of work uh, from home, Zoom calls and all, and all that and stuff. So people were always telling me, suggesting that I need to write a book on some of the things, most of the things, all the things that I've been through in my life, because my, my life has, um, like everyone else, has been up and down. It's been a roller coaster, and there's, there's, there has been some uh, major storms that I was caught in the midst of, and there was some storms that I was able and blessed to travel through. And so it's just lessons in life that I can um, really explain and express to a lot of people, especially the younger guys, you know, right, right. I watched both of you guys grow up. So I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm your father's age. So, you know, I'm 50, I rep the 50 club. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of lessons that I put in that book, uh, which is personal trials and tribulations, just to help you navigate through life a little better and easier because this test in life you have to take. Mm -hmm. I can't take your test personally for you, but me being an educator, I can prep and, and prepare you to take a test, but you still have to sit down and take that test yourself. So that's what that book is. One of the things that it's touching up on. What goes into writing a book? Oh, ah oh, man, testimony. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a lot. I learned a lot. Um, I wrote the whole book. There's no mm -hmm. ghost writing in there, and everything in the book is uh, my personal experiences, uh, my ups and downs, and it's it's a major redemption story on the second chance. Yeah. Um, it's all about a person who may have felt fallen down. You know, it might not be you personally, but you might have a brother or uncle or uh, another loved one in your family, you know, that might need to be inspired just to understand that your past mistakes is not your future destiny. How important are second chances? You, you mentioned second yes. chances and, you know, people feel like they made a mistake. You know, that's it. You know, life's over. It, that's false. You know, it's, it's second chances are very important. And, and I tell people, uh, life is full of choices. But the sad thing is, it's, it's, it has less chances, second chances on, on mistakes that you make. And so it's up to us as family members and our you know, elders and the family and in the village to help, again, navigate you guys because um, life is too short. Life is very precious. Um, but it's, it's not an Xbox game. You can't hit a reset button if you get back in there and you're playing Fortnite again. It's, it's not gonna happen like that. So it's just too serious. Mistakes are too costly nowadays. So mm -hmm. we have to play our part, helping um, our youth and some of the even adults. It's not all about a kid from the age of thirteen. Because in the book, I speak on how my life down spiral my senior year. Mm -hmm. So it went from eighty nine to I ran for city council, and I was challenged for my seat that I won that I ran, and then I had to go through this whole pardon process. So that just changed the whole palette of my taste buds. So that just um, changed the lens on the things that I saw. And then I went from a negative hustle into a positive 
grind mindset wise. No doubt. See, so you talked about senior year, you had a bunch of different options of going to college or going to trade school or yeah. figuring out what you wanted to do beyond high school. Mm -hmm. And you chose to jump into the drug game. I did. But where, where did that, why was, where was that inspired? Uh, you know, we, we watched a lot of TV, well I did back then, and again, straight out, when, when a lot of people was graduating from high school back in 89, when I graduated from, there was still um, the steel mills all around. Our, our fathers and grandparents probably worked in the steel mill, my father did, he was a welder. Um, so it was either, do you want to go in the steel mill, do you want to go into the service, do you want to be a police officer? So we didn't have that guidance in our, in, in our backyards where we had um, uncles who wasn't privileged to have connections and resources and said, you know what, as soon as you graduate, you need to go ahead and get into this police department. Mm -hmm. or you, need, you need to go for this fire department or you, or you need to go work housing or you need to go sewage. We didn't have that guy. We didn't have connections and resources that we had a family member or a peer that can actually get our foot into the door. So it's just privilege. Mm -hmm. It's all about who you know and what you know. Absolutely. And that shit kind of started with your generation. It did. You know, I, I mean, I look at people like you, Dana's dad, my dad, my uncle, um, you know, what they was able to do beyond high school and, and what everyone, you know, that we look up to was, you know, playing sports, obviously. And that's just something that we gravitated to. Right. Um, you know, some people take a different route like, like you did. Um, the consequences of you taking that route um, you know, you had a lot of time to think, sit down and, you know, try to figure out what was next. Um, you know, what was the journey like from the time that you got locked up to the time you figured out what you wanted to do next? Oh, well, my mind was made up very quickly, clearly. I was real clear, very fast. Um, but I was facing 12 years, 12 to 15 years, and I ended up taking a plea, uh, no contest for six to 15. So I had a lot of time to, to, to mind, change my mindset. And um, even before I came home, uh, I had the name of my barber shop. Actually, let me back up. I got my barber license in prison. Mm -hmm. Also got my manager license there. I had not that much time. So I had the shop drawn up. I had the name of the shop where I wanted it to be. So I had a vision, I had a plan. I had family behind me. Um, your father had also been uh, very supportive of me. So um, it was a challenge. You can't tell me I can't do something. You know, so I wanted to acquire the critics and I, and I wanted to uh, make my family crowd because I was the first and only one to go to prison. So I had a lot of fixing them to do, you know, mm -hmm. with my grandfather. I felt that as if I let them down. Yeah. And so I had a lot to prove. Yeah. I think something you said in a book, uh, one of the big myths, uh, they say a thug is always going to be a thug and they can never change. Um, how important was that to you coming out of jail, you know, and facing that, you know, you're already labeled. You know, that's just how it is. They label you as soon as you come out. How, how important was that to you to, you know, go against that, like to, to build yourself back up? I had to tell a parole officer one time, what, what, makes, what makes you, why do you feel as if I'm that bigger margin of the statistic that's going to be a repeat offender? What's, what's telling you that I'm not that smaller percentage that's not going to be a repeat offender? He couldn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. I said, well, let me answer it for you. I'm that smaller percentage that you're looking at. So I will not allow you to sit back on this other side of this desk and talk down upon me, um, mentally try to just make me feel as if I don't belong here. You're doing, you're doing me a favor and it, it doesn't happen like that. So I had out, they called me militant, but that wasn't militant. I just didn't bite my tongue. Mm -hmm. I said, everyone makes mistakes. There's not a one perfect person in this world. Mm -hmm. You know, I just did some things and I got caught for it mm -hmm. and I went away for it. So you will not hold that against me. And I just made it clear. I've always been like that. Yep, no doubt. You talk about not wanting to make your grandparents upset with you or not wanting to let them down. Um, what did it mean to you whenever you went in, you felt like you didn't have anyone that had your back whenever you went in? Your grandparents were willing to put up their house in order to get you out of jail. Uh, my great-grandmother, Bit, we called her Bit Mom. Mm -hmm. you, you might be with bit mom but um she didn't have a lot um i got rearrested twice the first time i paid one and then they rearrested me on the same charge so therefore that depleted the funds mm -hmm. so it also made it seem as if I, I was a zero on the scale so what they were trying to do the system is they were trying to layer me 
So I wasn't at zero, so I would get more parts, mm -hmm. stiffer set. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they rearrested me a month later on the same charge, and um, I couldn't pay uh, the money up front, the cash up front that they wanted, uh, my great grandmother put the house up. She said, baby, I don't have money, uh, but I love you. And uh, I put the house up and she said, but I'm saying, if they told me if you run, if you don't go to court, uh, that mama won't have a home. She said, so I love you and I trust you enough that you won't let that happen. And I promise you I will. That's powerful, yeah. man. I mean, at that age. And the house was very personal to her because she was 97 when she passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, she built that house back in 1962 from the ground up, wow. a black woman. So yeah, that was, yeah. she put up everything. That was her blood. Uh, sweat and tears that she right. put up for me. That's powerful, man. To give her your yeah. word at that age yeah. and say, you know what? I'm going I'm to go ahead and turn myself in because you did this for me. I mean, if you ask any person that's in their 20s right yeah. now, <laughs> they're yeah. like, yeah. Of how they go, built it. Ca ca like, catch, nah. catch me if you can. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Catch wow. me if you can. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but sitting in, in prison, um, you know, there was a lot, obviously life continues to go on out here in the real world. Um, you know, you lost your father while you were in prison. What what was that like? That was hard. Uh, me and my father was close. Uh, the last time I remember speaking to him or had spending time with him was a, a softball game. He played on the Claire in 88s. And so there was a game going on and I was running around and I said, yo, dad, I'll be back the game is over, I mean, before you play your game. And uh, I ended up getting arrested up at State College. I was never able to go back. Oh, wow. and so that was just our last call. But he was telling me, don't go, just come to the game. I'm like, nah, I'm, you know, I'm going to go. I'm good. I'll be right back. Never came right back. 44 years old. That's how old he was when he passed? Yeah, 44. Man, life's and precious, here, man. And I'm 50 now. I'm still here. It's and crazy. It, and it gets me choked up every now and then because I still see some of his childhood friends that still come to the shop still to this day, yeah. moving around, functional, you know, he grew up with your grandfather, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it was definitely personal. Absolutely. What uh, what got you through in that period of time, you know, pretty sure being inside, that's a struggle, um, just dealing with that mentally, what, what got you through that time? Prayer and anger. Yeah. That was my push and pull in the job. You know, the, I asked myself a lot of questions. Um, I was always a spiritual person, grew up in church. Um, and it's okay to ask God questions, but I understand now uh, everything happens for a reason. And that was just my development. I was just that diamond that was placed in that fire and was taking off the beating and, and, and the hammering, you know what I mean? A, a precious diamond looks like crap when you first pull it off the ground, right? But it's after you do all the fine tuning and the finishing and the polishing and all that type of stuff, that's when the true value and the shine of the diamond comes out. And so I, I just look at that was um, my way of God allowing me because he had his hands on me. So as long as I was in his hands, even though I was in the midst of the fire, I still came, I still came out not smelling like smoke, still shining as these lights are around us. Absolutely. And you had people that loved you you had people that was in your corner, you know, people who believed and you supported you. Um, while you was doing your time, the early lessons from the chair, are those some things that you reflect on while you were while you were doing your time? And what were some of the early lessons that that you kind of carried with you and still um, you know, you utilize today? Yeah. Um, some of my early one of my earliest lessons were what is and I speak on it in the book was my loyalty. You know, if I give you my word, if if I if I rock with you, you know, you won't have to worry about uh, me stealing from you, robbing you. I will look after you and your siblings, your wife. Your, you know, what I mean, I'm just that loyal. That that was one of the reasons how it was so easy to set me up because my word was my bond. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but my, my father always taught me to, you know, a man always got to keep his word. You know, so that I guess. That was a blessing and a curse early on that I learned. And as I travel through life going up and down, um, I understand that there's a purpose behind everything. A lot of people uh, get into situations uh, in life and, and, and they, you know, cry and have a pity party and 
and ask why me, why me. I, and I did that. I didn't cry for almost like my first year. And I was in four different maximum penitentiaries. Um, but getting back to what I was saying, a lot of people pray to God and um, they pray that he would cast down this mountain, that they don't have to hike this hill and, and you know, create a bridge over these troubled waters or whatnot. And, and I realized, me personally, that's the wrong prayer to ask because everything happens. Everything has a purpose and a reasoning. So that I started learning to pray, not to cast a mountain down, but just to give me the strength to endure and climb that mountain to the top. Because as I climb it, I'm building character. I'm, I'm building everything. I'm, cal I'm it's just calluses being put on all my hands and all my feet. So once I get to the top, I need to be strong. I will be built and prepared mentally and physically to, to take on any challenge. Mm -hmm. And so that prepared me for these days now. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's powerful. And you keep talking about, you know, spirituality and trusting in God and, you know, being God's, you doing God's work here on earth. Um, how formative was it for you whenever you came out of jail to meet Pastor Curtis and get involved in the church? Yeah, that, uh, Dr. Curtis, that's my big brother. Um, how I met him uh, was a blessing. You know, that was just God. Um, when I do this, uh, my son, little Corey, uh, my junior, when I used to walk with him, and I'm going to answer that question, but when I used to walk with him, he used to get tired of me holding his hand up because we were so tall, yeah. you know, right? So we have kids, we can relate to that. So what I started doing was uh, I let his hand down and I would just put my hand on his head mm -hmm. and I would walk with him and I would just turn his head left and right. So uh, God has always little Corey me, mm -hmm. even when, even before I had little Corey and I even thought of this. So how I met Pastor Curtis was I was in a halfway house, um, ironically, your dad had to come get me, had to sign me out at this halfway house. And um, they made me take these programs, these this stupid stuff that really, it, it didn't apply to me, but they still made me do AA, NA, and all this other stuff. Mind you, I never did drugs, but they wasn't trying to hear it. They said, you, if you don't do this, you're not. we're not gonna release you. So then I had to do community service in the churches and whatnot. So I was on North Negley, 501 North Negley, East Liberty. Mount Air was around the corner um, on Lincoln Lawn. So I had to go to the church and uh, and I had to prove that I was at the church and I had to get a pamphlet signed by the pastor that I went to Bible study, that I went to groups or whatever. And that was Pastor Curtis's first year uh, at Mount Air Baptist Church. And it was just something, an error that he felt because I, mind you, I had a lot of anger in me still. So, you know, I was home looking people who owe me money, mm -hmm. you know, I, I still had that. I had a lot of dirty water still mm -hmm. trapped inside of me and I didn't turn that release valve and allow that water to run out of me. And, you know, when dirty water gets caught in something, right. you gotta let it run. Mm -hmm. I wasn't letting it run for the clean water to flow mm -hmm. through. And he must have felt that. And I used to go there, black hoodie, just black, just, I was just mad. You figured <laughs> I was 97. Yeah. You know, and he, he's, he's from the hood. He's from Baltimore originally. And it was just something that God allowed him and I to connect. And uh, that's just that's just how our brotherhood grew from there. And even as I uh, left out of the halfway house six months, he would always, always keep in contact with me. You know, there was times we would ride bikes together and let's say a year later, you know, I might have was thinking of doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. He would call my phone. What you doing, young brother? Uh, you know, I'm just chilling fast, you know, we're about to ride, come on, we're going to wait for you down at the church. Mm -hmm. I would just stop and drop everything that I was doing. So, again, that's God, just a little quick. Yeah, right, right. Right. Yeah. Right. And how to, uh, you know, you speak highly of, you know, church, your religion, your spiritual. How did your role in the church evolve over time? Because uh, now you're a deacon, right? So, uh, yes. how did that role evolve into you eventually becoming a deacon? Mm. I ran from that um, because I felt as if I wasn't that mate deacon material to be, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't just, okay, we just say you're a deacon, I'm an ordained deacon, so it was a process that I had to go through, it was a diaconate that I had to go through, uh, standing in front of 
a whole uh, board and a catechizer and 10 other pastors and whatnot. So I felt as if that wasn't for me because, you know, if you hit me, I'm still punching you back. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know the Bible say turn out the cheek, but I'm going to pray about it later. You know what I mean? God ain't done with me. I never made straight A's in school. I'm not going to make straight A's in my Christianity while, mm -hmm. you know, so and I used to tell Pastor that he would, he would laugh. And um, just me being around him for so long. Yeah. And um, by me losing my grandfather, that pushed me over the ledge. And he had, um, my name had came up again. It was 30 of, uh, it was 100 people at Mount Air. Mount Air is a very good church. Mm -hmm. So it was like 100 names. And I had now, I think my name was one out of two dozen. And so when he brought it to my attention again, I was like, all right, well, you know, I'll, I'll, if you think, you know, I'll try it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it was a long year process, but yeah, I'm an ordained deacon now at Mount Airy um, Baptist Church under Pastor William Curtis. That's powerful, man. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah. Not, not everybody can say that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's a good man, great man. Too. It's especially where you started from. I mean, yeah. you talk about where you started from and then becoming a deacon. I mean, that that journey is something that anyone can look at mm -hmm. for inspiration, motivation. So, I mean, you know, continue doing what you're doing because obviously people are watching, people are looking, and they're gonna always gonna watch. And, and, it's, and it's special, mm -hmm. but. Going back to 97, you just said, you know, you had a bunch of anger in you, you got yeah. the black hoodie on, yeah. and you're still trying to figure it out. You yeah. know, you try to you get, got your barber license, got your barber managing yep. certificate while you're in prison. You come out, you work in a barber shop, but they tell you that's not good enough. You can't go to a barber yeah. shop. You got to go to McDonald's or something yeah. because this is the way that we're going to regulate it. That's part of the system. When I yeah. came out, yeah, they made me, you had to get a job. And so they said, okay, you got a barber manager. You got a Pennsylvania uh, state license. You can go work in the shop. Uh, so I went and I did the interview um, at a barber shop. I did a couple barber shops in Pittsburgh, at Homewood and Wilkinsburg, but I ended up at uh, Fresh Cuts in Wilkinsburg. Oh, no. Uh, I forget the street, Wood Street. So I did the interview, I did good, and I got hired. So I went back and I told them, you know, Lottie died, this is, this is that, here's the address, here's the owner's name, whatever. They said, okay, you can work here, but we need to have a signed signature of your the, the, the days and the hours that you work, and it has to be signed by the owner and a licensed barber manager. Here, I was a licensed barber manager. <laughs> signing and own sign, But signing it with the <laughs> owner. So they said I had too much control of what I was doing, and so therefore they made me quit the job. And I had to go work at McDonald's in Oakland for six months uh, to I completed my entire stay at the halfway house. That was crazy. <laughs> That's crazy, man. <laughs> but that was a blessing too, right? Yeah. Because um, I got to meet the owner, and um, I mastered everything. So as long as you got work, you don't got to be in a halfway house. Mm -hmm. As long as you are active in the community, like at the church or whatnot. So that's what I was doing. So I was always being active. I was always going to work. And so the owner at McDonald's, he realized what was going. And um, he took a liking to me. So I mastered it. I tell all my students, this, you, listen, as long as you master your fundamentals at whatever it is that you're doing, you'll be fine. So I mastered the buns, I mastered the grill, <laughs> the fries, the lobby, you know, so it, it went well. I made it work for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I played the hand that I was dealt with. Cool. So you were able to go through the process of, you know, not working in a barbershop, having to work at McDonald's, and then getting back into the barbershop, a few years after that, you were able to open up Cool Cuts, right. the original Cool Cuts, <laughs> the yeah. one that we all know and love, <laughs> the place that we grew up. We look, we grew yeah. up in Cool Cuts, man. I mean, Speed yeah. probably cut us for a little bit whenever yeah. we was young, but we pretty much grew up in Cool Cuts, man. What was the feeling whenever you first opened up the barbershop? It was a feeling of, great accomplishment because um, one of my prayers was that you know God would allow my grandfather uh, to be part of me changing my life and getting things done he had a little black book I, I put that in the book and he when he would come visit me in prison he would we would have deep conversations and he would hold me accountable and he was like I want to see you do this I want to eat cake I want you to get married do it right mm -hmm. and so you know um, God answered my prayer he allowed my grandfather to check off everything in his little black book so that was that was perfect. Uh, I 
I came home in 97. I did the six months in a halfway house. I opened up the original Cool Cuts downtown on Fifth Avenue. Um, it seemed like the world took one knee off of my neck. But it was always still another one because then, you know, you got the, the, the haters and the people just going, well, he, he's back at it again. How he get a shot this fast? He only been home a year and it's not going to last. Um, sadly to say, if they did any research, they would have realized that I did a three year business plan through the city of McKeesport through a redevelopment program. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like I went and dug up some money that I had buried in the yard. And I'm coming home and I'm right. back to my old tricks. That was not the case. So to open up down there, um, to work, I worked there first. And then the owner was moving to Atlanta and he gave me the opportunity to buy the shop. Mm -hmm. um, that was a test itself because I didn't have the money. Um, I knew how to get the money, mm -hmm. but that was right. a tease, you know what I mean? So I'm like, eh. And then I met a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Pittman who was very good friends with my grandfather. And he gave me some hurdles. And he said, look, I can help you, but you have to do X, Y, Z. And you gotta be serious about it. And so that's what I did. And that's how Cool Cuts um, was brought to life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you had that written up while you were in prison. In prison, yes. Isn't that, and I've and I written this up I went in in 91. So I written this up. I got my, received my manager license with by like 93, 94. So I written this up maybe late 92, late 93. And here I was actually doing it in 90, 98. Yeah, I was fun. working at Cool Cuts in 98, but Cool Cuts was officially mine in 99. You hit it on the head, cuz yeah. you stuck to the plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. how, how, how difficult was it for you to have that vision in your mind while you're sitting in jail to coming out and really making that vision a reality. Because, I mean, that it's hard to do. You know, even people who are free out here have a vision of doing something, but the consistency and sticking to the plan is so hard. Like, what was your motivation to really say, you know what? This is gonna happen, and this I'm gonna make sure that it happens. <laughs> Looking at them prison bars, and <laughs> <laughs> they get no simpler yeah, than yeah, that, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Say for me, I do not right. see me again. Actually, I told a guard that because you know that's the mentality and the ignorance uh -huh. inside there when I was leaving. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll be back, Sanders. I said, man, don't put your house on it because yeah. you and your family will be homeless. <laughs> you will never see me in here again. And what that's just the mentality that that's some. You know, there was a lot of good officers, correctional officers there, but there was a, a whole lot of bad apples and they're everywhere. All right, all right. Yeah. What is your message whenever the kids are walking into the shop now? I mean, call it what you want, but you know, we come from a case board. You know, we see it all. You walking up and down the street, we see it all. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people who can easily follow right in the footsteps that you follow whenever you graduate high school. Um, Whenever you kind of see someone going down that path, what is your initial thoughts and what is your initial actions? My initial thought of this the person is that was you, mm -hmm. you know, and um, how can I connect to this person? You know, the barbershop is a biblical core to the community. Every barbershop is not the, the cornerstone of the city because there's barbershops everywhere, like there's mm -hmm. steak stores and family dollars and dollar generals. But if you're blessed, to be that cornerstone of your community. It's your duty to try to at least, in my opinion, I try to bless somebody, at least one person a day. Mm -hmm. And blessings can be anything, you know what I mean? By giving them guidance, giving them my number because I see they're going down the wrong path. Just giving them strong, solid advice. Everyone don't have a mom and a father inside their household. Everyone don't have a big uncle and a mentor that they can look up to. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I try my best to reach out to the, the younger ones come through and even the ones you guys age, you'd be amazed how many times i might be um when i would go out and i'll do happy hour or whatever and someone to see me and they feel more comfortable of picking my brain mm -hmm. outside a bar or inside of applebee's or wh wherever they might catch me they, they feel more comfortable because they don't have to put on that facade around their boys mm -hmm. you know and that's what i always use cool cuts for you know what I mean? That is the place. That is the neutral spot. And I'm, I've been blessed to 
uh, be downtown McKeesport for 18 years. And uh, I had the respect and the blessings that the shop was always neutral. Mm-hmm. Whether you from Harrison, Crawford, sure. or wherever, the shop was neutral. You know, the police officers will come in and get a cut. If they had a warrant for you, they're not going to drag you out the chair. They're not going to disrespect the shop. They're not going to, they're going to tell you, you know, we're looking for you. We ain't gonna wait for you to come out there, but you need to handle your business when you get out of here. So I was blessed that the shop was neutral. Everything, every business downtown Fifth Avenue either got robbed, got the window broke, or something like that. Every business from City Hall all the way down to the state store, not the barbershop. So I've been blessed to to have that coverage. And that's a testament to the respect people have for you, absolutely. You know what? That's crazy, because I was going to say the same exact words. <laughs> like, literally, I was going to say the same exact words. That's a testament. It man. is. Yeah. It is. Even, even if, you know, we spoke, you know, people hating, doing that, you hate, but you go, at the end of the day, they still got some type of respect for you. Yeah, it's a respect thing. Yeah, and, and you know what? It's, it's so much lacking that nowadays. Like, there was more codes back then. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no code now. Nah. Nah. Like, dudes, dudes so, just don't uh, like it. Or, you know, <laughs> they'll just tell for free. They don't even want to reward money. Like, ah, now nah, that's on the strip. I don't even like that dude. Yeah. Play, you know, you know it's, it's dog. my daughter likes him or my wife likes him or yeah. says something positive about right. this guy. So now nah, you got a personal uh, issue with me because of the lack, whatever it is that you're having. Now you want to put that on. That's, yeah. All you gotta do is sit down and talk to me. I'm very easy to talk to. I'm very easy to find. Right. It's, I'm not hiding. I don't have an entourage where you can't see me. You can come to the shop, get a haircut, you can catch me down the county and out through the DA's department at the Center for Victims. I wear many hats, so I'm very accessible. Yeah. I know previously we talked uh, before this, you, you said something about many hats. Uh, you're one of you're the only uh, African American. Um, correct me. What is it? In Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, uh, I'm a state proctor uh, for the barber examiner. So, when I started in prison, I came home. I, I had received my barber license, then I received my manager license, then I received my teacher license. Now, the only thing above a teacher license is a state proctor, aka is called a technical technical senior barber evaluator. What that is is I oversee all the schools. The barber schools in the state of Pennsylvania, which is Pittsburgh, Philly, Erie, Harrisburg, and Scranton. But I only do the Pittsburgh area because I got bigger fish to fry right now. But that's just an option that I can expand if I want to. So there's not, I don't believe there's no black uh, African American uh, state proctor uh, from the city of McKeesport or representing the city of Pittsburgh. Now there might be one or two, and I'm I'm saying one or two, maybe in Philly or Harrisburg here and there, but the percentage is very small. So my my resume on my barbering, um, there's not too many, especially a black man. And I can count on maybe a half of a finger, right. maybe not even half a finger, just representing the Pittsburgh area. That's dope. Yeah. I love all of the positive stuff that, stuff that we're talking about because mm-hmm. the way the interview started to the way that the interview's going now, it, it took a total 360 or total 180. Talk about, in the book, you talk about the power of positive reverse. Once you understand, it's, it's mathematics, yeah, whether, and it's not gotta be, it doesn't have to be trig and all that. And you know, I don't do it. After algebra, I wasn't going on higher. So I try to keep it simple, <laughs> you know? So it's all about once you see a problem and you understand how it works in reverse, even if the problem is, is hard and confusing, but once you tap into that, like a sap tree, and then you can receive that that sap that's inside, now, now you, you, you have the ability to change a negative hustle into a positive grind in life. And that's just what I learned to do. You know, I, I told my grandfather, when I came home, I was gonna flip the government. What I mean by that, there's nothing illegal about what I was saying. What I was saying is the, learning the power of positive reverse how I can make things work for me, how I can connect myself with the right people, how I can plug myself into the right resources. You know, um, at my job, they laugh and they call me the therapeutic barber surgeon. You know what I mean? Not only am I working on a person's outer appearance, I'm working on their inner appearance because working at the Center for Victims, uh, Center, Center for Victims, on the south side, I work on the trauma, the untreated trauma unit of the brain. And so 
that allows me to be that third rail because the title there is a community specialist in diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So I get to work with a lot of great people, a lot of therapists and whatnot. And I see how they view a person and how they use their doctor degrees of painting a picture of a person. Mm -hmm. But then I add the diversity and I change the lens on a person's background, a person's situation. And then all I'm doing is reframing it. And then I just ask them to look at the picture. Now. So there's a lot of like, that's one of the other feathers that you know, I bring to the table. But it's all about learning the power of reverse. Yep. It's just simple math. Yeah. yeah. Talked about connecting with you know, the right people once you got out. Um, that led you to wanting to do more for the community and just say, you know what, the way that I do more for the community is running for city council. What was, why did you want to do that in the first place? I, I know you want to do more for the community. What was your thought process of running for city council and how did that come about? That started in a barbershop again. Uh, the, the, listen, a barbershop is, is, is the black community's uh, school board meetings and city councils, those who don't go there. Mm -hmm. So they would always come to the shop with issues and, and you know, we would have real shop talk about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would always hear these issues and then they would, well, you need to say something, so, you know what I mean? You need to at least be that voice for us. So I would go down at the time and I would be able to, you know, speak to um, a certain mayor or a police officer. And I would be like, look, this is our problem. This is A, B, C, D. How can we rectify this? This is the problem. Here's my opinion of the solution. So I would always go down there. I would always go to the school and speak to the kids, you know, because I adapt to the kids. I got a, a lot of kids myself. So most of the kids come to the barbershop. I know the kids. I know their family. So it was so easy uh, for the community to ask me, you need to think about uh, running for city council. I said, well, you know what? That's a thought. I said, I'll pray on it. You know, and so um, my clients suggested, some of my, a lot of my order uh, guys suggested that I need to run. I should run because at the time there was not too many black faces mm -hmm. on city council board. I mean, and that's just, that's just how the demographics is around here. There's not too many black faces on school board. I mean, there are three now, um, but there's never been a black superintendent. There's never been a black mayor in Keysport. There's never been a black chief of police. But still, if you look at the percentages of uh, white and brown face, black and brown faces, it doesn't balance out. So you, you, you have to connect yourselves with the people that you're serving because everybody is not going to feel as if they can be that person. No doubt. You know, so you have to install you have to install that in, in our use minds because everything your mind controls everything. Oh, yeah, for sure. It'll break your your your, your insides down. It'll break how you see things. It'll break down the, how you digest things. Your brain, your them neuron them neuron nerves mm -hmm. control your whole body. Yeah, for sure. And, and and you hit it on the head. I mean, these little kids, mm -hmm. they only think that they can be what they see, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? I, I see someone who looks like me, who grew up in the same place that I grew up from doing X, Y, and Z. You know what, I could do that too. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But if they never seen that, they don't think they could do it. And this is why you're supposed to be transparent with your kids. You don't show them everything. You, you show them things on different layers. Mm -hmm. You don't want to confuse them. But you have to show them that, listen, daddy failed, uncle failed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But let me show you how uncle got back up. No doubt. You know, there was a little kid a long time ago. Um, I want to say like three years ago, we we laughed at it, but it was it was very serious. And it's all about race right now, and but it's always going to be an issue because people don't really want to people do not really want to sit down and dig deep to the core. This little boy had to be five years old, maybe six years old. He was playing with a little gun. We were standing outside, in front of the shop, playing with a little gun. Police car rides by. The uncle or the brother said, um. Uh, of course, you were, oh, they got a police right there. The little boy put the gun down slowly and backed up. We laughed, but that's a serious issue. Man. It is serious. It's real serious. Ser and the little boy was serious, five years old. So how how do you fix that again? Understanding the power of reverse, mm -hmm. we need to start implementing ourselves in problems. You know, we need to be at those meetings before the meetings, not just the public meeting. We need to sit at these tables. We need to negotiate and be the voices and have 
uh, the, the, the common sense and good judgment to help regulate and pretty much be the voice for the people and be fair about it. No doubt. So you ran for city council. You won, yeah. but you didn't win. Yeah. Ain't that so, yes. <laughs> yeah. You won, but you didn't win. <laughs> yeah. So what Challenge was the see. deal behind that? Well, I ran. At first, it was a joke. I wasn't supposed to win, and it wouldn't get far, and all that stuff. So, uh, but this, the law states that you can run if you're a felon. Mm -hmm. uh, you can run. It's called an infamous crime. I did my research on it, um, but it's kind of tricky. You can run for a seat, but if you win that seat, and if that seat is challenged, you can't hold it. So I ran, and I won, and the seat was challenged by the the current administration and so the ones that i beat felt as if if they challenged me they would get their seat back by default and back to the definition of an infamous crime an infamous crime states and they added some stuff after that but originally it stated that you can't be a sitting official and commit a felony i was never a sitting official mm -hmm. so i was scratching my head trying to figure out what, what the what is but they added some stuff so it can be, you don't have to technically be a sitting official mm -hmm. and create and, cre and commit a crime to be removed. So the city, um, the key sport, um, had removed me. Um, after I got removed, uh, strange thing is, uh, I built a rapport uh, maybe a year, year later, year and a half later with uh, the district attorney's office who was sent to remove me from that seat. And then I started working I'm still currently How still to this day. Yeah. 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 You know. <laughs> the person that was sent to remove right. you ended up being somebody that you're working with. Yeah, they were crying to the to the, uh, Mr. Zafala to remove me on technicalities in the law. Mm -hmm. So he had to do what he swore in to yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. And um, he got to know me. He got to know Corey Saint. Actually, when he met me, he said, you know what? I'm glad I got to know the man in person instead of the little boy on this piece of paper mm -hmm. that did what he did back in 91. Yeah. Those were his words. And it's crazy. Just build a relationship after that. Nin 1991. Yeah. And what year was this? 2019, 18? What year was yeah. this? Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, 16. 2016. You, yeah. you got out what, 97? I got out 97. 97. May of 97. Yep. So 97. from 97 to so now. I went, in, I went in 91. Yes. You did so nothing. I did, and that's nothing. the only and, thing. Yes. And it, it got to, uh, took, uh, taken away from me. And I wasn't supposed to make it this far. Keep in mind, that's just how the system is created. I, I was given a 6 to 15. Mm -hmm. So I did five years, three months, 22 days behind those physical bars. Did the rest in the halfway house. Mm -hmm. Then I still had to come out and deal with state parole. Mm -hmm. So after I did that time, I so I did 15 years for the, throughout the whole system. Mm -hmm. And I'm not crying or boohooing about it, but I'm saying that's just how the system is because um, to be... A black man, if you if you and it's always going to be black and white, and, and I'm not trying to play the race card. I'm playing the facts card. Mm -hmm. If it was little Tommy or little Billy or Jimmy, and it was me, and we had the same identical charges, same zero on the scale, same judge, I get six to fifteen. If you're trying to give me twelve to fifteen, because I wouldn't go, because I wouldn't tell on someone. Little Tommy, little Billy, he might get half of that or not even none of that because you know what. He's a good kid. He made a bad choice. This I'm just 19, a hood. You yeah. know, throw the kid away. This was 1991. Yes. Are we still seeing some of the same things today? Oh, for sure. It's just, um, it's, uh, we got 5K TVs now. So yeah. it's more, it's, it's more vivid. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it's just being recorded yeah. now. Yeah. So what, imagine what was going on with all these phone recordings yeah. and all that. I can only stuff. imagine. Yeah. That's why I speak on some of the things there. And it's like, the, the, if I did something wrong, I can't be mad at a police officer. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why a lot of people were mad at cops back in the day. Okay, we need them. I understand. Mm -hmm. I, I got family members as police officers, but you... Shout you out to Marty. Yeah, my cousin. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you, you're not going to be the man of the law, and you catch me doing something wrong, but then you take half of mine. Mm -hmm. You lock me up. Take half of my money. Only turn half in, and you pocket the rest. All right. And you have the mentality to say, well, you know what? I'm out here risking my life every day. It's, I deserve to know you, you're in the wrong profession there. No doubt. You know, that's when the community, that's when the hood start disliking police officers. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm mad at you for doing your job. I'm looking at the degree that you're doing your job. You crooked now. 
Now guess what? You just a thug like I am. But you're hiding behind that badge. Yep. You have to regulate and balance that. What about? So go through city council, get denied. What was the process like from there? Are you able to hold a seat now? If so, why? If not, why not? I can do whatever I want now. I got a full part by Governor Wolf. I don't even have a, you can't Google or search and find anything. I think I might be one of the cleanest records as an adult in the city of McKee. This <laughs> might be cleaner than some people in the administration right now. But uh, I can run and I uh, will be running for mayor uh, the next term here in McKee School. Where, where did that come about? Uh, the slap in the face just changed the whole my, the palette, my whole taste bud changed. I don't want the council seat now. I, run this, I want the seat that sat back and giggled and smiled and laughed at when all this stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what year is the next election? Uh, the primary, you figure, so this May coming up, it'll be the primary for a few other seats. And so, so after this May, between May and November, uh, that's when I'll be starting to lock and load my ammo for the following mayor, uh, for the following May, for the primary. Excitement. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know what? I'm not trying to Mike Tyson this thing. I want an old Ollie fight 15 rounds. If I knock you down, I want to help you up. You know, I, right. I, I've been training for this stuff. No doubt. So I, uh, and towards the end of the book, you talk about, um, you know, challenging your daughter, you know, at, uh, kind of a like, yeah. She's the reason that pushed you to mayor. She started her doctorate. Yeah. Right? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, my daughter, my family, they inspire me. You know, they they are my actual, they are my actual um, power, power pack. So my daughter, she graduated uh, from Hampton and then my other daughter's in uh, Slippery Rock. And so she's going to get her, she's working towards to get her doctors, but so is my oldest daughter from Hampton in optometry. So when they saw the stuff that was going on, they said, you know what? You'll be all right, Dad. Don't worry about it. Um, you Don't even run. They, actually, they told me, you know, <clears throat> don't even run for that. Go go for the bigger seat. Yeah. And I'll go for my, we'll do this together. I'll go for my doctors. You go for that seat in the city, uh, for the mayor's seat. Ooh. I said, you got to challenge it. So that's <laughs> one thing you don't do. Challenge me or see I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's personal. Bite you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got spoons and forks for, for some, for what you call that pie. Uh, 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 dang, what's that? I don't know if I can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, crazy. I've <laughs> heard that saying before. Yeah, but, um, that's an old school that's saying. Old school <laughs> yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's it's a pie. It. They call it something. <laughs> humble pie. Oh, yeah, humble yeah, humble pie. pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. see, I wasn't going to go rated R. It's a humble pie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's your turn. Have a, have a bite. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. No doubt. Have two so, slices. So, you got two more coming through high school now. Yes. Pray for me. You <laughs> say pray. Well, <laughs> but they're soonly approaching a point of life where they're going to graduate high school and are going to come to a decision of you know what's next. You know, you went through your senior year, you made your decision. What is your advice to your kids as they come up to that fork in the road? My advice is always be a leader and do better than mom and dad. You know, and then I, sh I show them each year, I give them a different chapter of experiences and lessons and mistakes that I made. You know, it's, I don't know the exact time that I, I tell them X, Y, Z, but I, I time it that it balances right. Because you don't want to give a kid too much. You know, a baby eats baby food. Then you got to start chewing the food and putting it in their mouth. And then that's what, at least that's what our grandparents did. And then as you get older, you allow them to maybe experience McDonald's and Burger King and all that. And then as they get older, young adults, now they can go eat their own food. So life is like that. You got to ration out different servings of food to your child. And as they grow up from uh, preschool, pre preschool all the way to senior, you got to know when to give them certain um, meals to eat and like food. And Corey is, well, both of them, Jatis and Corey are both you know, playing sports right now. Jati's yes. playing basketball. Corey's playing soccer. Um, how is it, how important is it for you to be visible at those games and be supportive and what they want to do? It's very important because uh, I've learned this working at my job at the center. Uh, a lot of kid, a lot of our kids will have 
will have to go through microaggression. And what that is, is Corey experienced it. Um, some ignorant parents would talk out loud about my past mistakes or your past mistakes in front of their kids or to their kids. So now if my son is better than your son or just as good as your son or, or does a good hit on your son on a football field or something like that, the kid is going to be a kid. Uh, that's why your dad did this, your dad did that. How this little kid know this? I tell you how he knows from the, from from home. So now my son and my daughter are gonna get upset because I don't hide nothing from them. They know about it. But you're not just gonna tease another kid about talking about mom and dad. So then my son is wrong, or my daughter is wrong if he can't control himself and he and he haul off and hit the kid that said that. You know what I mean? So I got to prepare them for everything that's gonna most of the stuff. I can't prepare them for everything. But I got to prepare them for a lot of the stuff that they will come head to head with in life. So that's why it's, it's very important to talk to your communication. It is important in life, period. In your marriage, your relationship with your kids, you have to talk. Okay. But you got to talk to the level where they can comprehend it. And so I just tell them to be be a leader, be ready. You know, and and, and just stay, just keep pressing on, just, just stay focused. But it's going to come. Yeah. Now you talk about, you know, not keep anything from your kids. Now, when you first came home after doing your time, how was that a hard conversation to have with your oldest? Caleb is my oldest, so he saw, he witnessed all of that. Okay. Yes. So actually, the f other kids besides Caleb did not experience that. They're only here. Now. That's why I was talking about this, the microaggression. My four other kids is only hearing stuff that other kids are repeating that they heard from their mom, dad, uncle, or big brothers, or right. the ones that I went to school with. But Caleb physically was there. Right. Yes. Okay. So you have to prepare your child for that as they growing up. Yeah. Because they're going to, listen, man, it's just going to be snakes everywhere. That's why I, I tell people I keep my grass cut real low. Matter, of, I'm not even, 2022, I don't even want grass. It's just going to be straight <laughs> turf. You know what I mean? So I need to see the snakes of I need to see the heads of every snake that's gonna be slithering and walking past me. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, I think we can finish it on that, man. Yes, sir. You know, I think this I think this was powerful, man. Mm -hmm. You know, we appreciate what you mean to the community. Thank you. You know, we appreciate what you did with this book. Yeah. We appreciate you open up opening up and then really just showing us that once you're a thug and you're labeled a thug, you don't have always have to be labeled that way. Uh, you know, story. We appreciate, you know, the power of positive reverse. Yes. And we appreciate all of the lessons from the chair, man. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. And I'll end with this. Your life is your picture. Mm -hmm. Never let another person Picasso your life. Paint your own picture with your own brush. You frame it, and then you put your signature in that corner. Exactly. Never let another person narrate your story. You tell your own story. You live your story, you tell it. You paint your picture, you sign it. No one else has the power or the energy or authority to do it. So about that. <laughs> That's Make sure y'all go ahead and get lessons from the chair. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on the on the website. Where else can we find it? Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's on Kindle E. It's on all the. Any, anywhere you look, you yeah. can find it. So make sure you go get it. You yes, know? sir. Appreciate Thank you, good dog. Appreciate it. Y'all keep doing your thing too. Yeah. But oh, you guys no, are doing no. some good things. You appreciate, know? It's appreciate it. It's not all about me. The thing this wouldn't happen without you guys. Absolutely. You know so. You guys are inspiring these younger guys too that played sports mm -hmm. and wanted to ha shoot for the moon mm -hmm. and it fell a little short. But guess what? That star is just as bright as that moment. So, this is what you guys are showing them. Appreciate it. So appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, make sure y'all go ahead and hit that follow button for status 412 underscore mm -hmm. on the Instagram mm -hmm. and follow it on social media and make sure you're keeping up with what we're doing, man. Try to make sure bringing positivity, influence to. Your kids and, you know, everyone's trying to figure out what they want to do beyond sports. And if you want to continue to play sports, make sure that you know that we're all here for you. So, yep. Till the next time. Thanks. Be out. St 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 St